Welcome to Motorbike Mondays, episode 6. This is Evan from Race Tech Electric. And this is Brady from Seaweed and Gravel. And this is Jared from Seaweed and Gravel. So, welcome back to the show. Um, you guys probably noticed we took a little bit of time off um, just being around Thanksgiving and all. We were all pretty busy, so it was kind of hard to get together. But we are getting back on schedule now, so hopefully we will uh, get a bunch of new content done and we'll be starting to release shows on Mondays from now on. That's the plan. So Except we, for tomorrow. Yeah, well, we'll have a show out this week, which will be tomorrow, which is Wednesday. Wednesday. And then next week on Mondays. We'll be, hopefully be back on track. We will try and stick with that. So kind of depends on our schedules, but we're going to shoot for that. We're pretty busy, guys. So We're really busy and important. And really pretty. So. I had... <laughs> I had three Thanksgivings this year. That's not bad. That's yeah. pretty cool. That's a lot of turkey. It's a lot hey, of work. That's awesome. I had three Thanksgivings as well. Yeah. Yours was one of them. Mm-hmm. Then we went to, I had my parents' Thanksgiving, and then we went to Emily's friend's house for Thanksgiving, too. Mm. Yeah, that pretty Put your mic explain. right in front of your mouth. It, yeah, there you go. Right there? Yeah. yeah it records better. ten times better if you like hold it. Right there. Oh. I, like, I usually like holding my arm like as far away from my face as I can. <laughs> Just well, think of it as a. Sorry, I'm freezing. It's like well, super cold is, in here. It's that's like what happens minus when 30. we record in a warehouse. Is <laughs> it is an average temperature of 50 degrees in here? Not uh, even that. All day and all night. It's probably below 50 in here right now. That'd be like the Bahamas so, right now if it were 50. I'm fine. Yeah. I got my Christmas wool sweater on. Yeah, you're pretty festive yeah, uh, tonight. <laughs> Um, yeah, and you might notice that, uh, you can hear us a little bit more clear. And, yeah, hopefully um, this sounds ten times better, because we, uh, it seems like it does. got some, uh, new equipment in for the podcast, and so we are running fresh mics, board, and cables, and, uh, this is for you guys. We are Thank finally you. professional, although we ended up getting... Guitar Center had a sale on white microphones, which was probably not the best after you've been working on a bike all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think right. they're black already. already. We've covered, already yeah. covered them in Greece, but that's all right. Um, and if you may Greece. notice, this isn't just how my voice sounds under a clear microphone. I've been <laughs> wicked sick for the past few days. Now so. that you have a real mic, you sound like shit. Yeah, Ricky. so I'm going to do my best not to pass out for this entire time. So. <laughs> um, so, anyways, we have some news. We uh, we hit uh, number four on the nice. iTunes yeah. automotive section rankings, which was awesome. Yeah, unexpected. Um, yeah, yeah, we didn't think we'd get up there that fast, and um, we're doing pretty well. So, thanks to everybody for, thanks listening. for listening, guys. Stick with us. Uh, we're gonna keep doing a lot of new shows and stuff, and hopefully, uh, stay up there in the top couple automotive podcasts. Um, so let's see, we have a couple of comments to read. Um, we had a guy, Anthony, send a comment in on the website that said, I've been listening to your podcast the last couple weeks and have really enjoyed them. I'm looking forward to the next one. I have a question. What is the website you found that has the ability to find what bikes a specific part was used on? This info would be awesome. Keep up the good work. I'm working on a 69 CD 175. Next project is a CL350 with the blown piston. So good luck on those projects. Um, the website I was talking about was called, um, it's called parts. Well, it's the manufacturer name partshouse.com. So there's a Honda partshouse.com, Kawasaki, Yamaha, Yamaha blah, blah, blah. Um, put in the make and then partshouse.com and they have all the OEM part listings for all the Japanese manufacturers. They might do them for others too, but I've only used them for Honda and Suzuki and all that. Um, you can search by Honda, uh, by like ATV parts, motorcycle parts, scooter parts, whatever. And then you search by year. Anyways, you can drill down into the, uh, microfish listings and find the OEM part number for the specific part you're looking for. And then if you go back to the section screen, like for instance, motorcycle or ATV, on the right side, there is a box that says search by part number. So once you've found the OEM part number you want, you can then paste it in and search by it, and it will give you a listing of everywhere that exact part number is used in the catalog. Yeah, it's really, really helpful. I use it a lot for 
uh, staters. Like when I'm trying to figure out mm-hmm. what else a particular stater works on. I can find the OEM number and then search it, and then I get the whole listing. Yeah, offer that to all of those. That's cool. Yeah, it's really useful. So anyways, I know that exists for all the Japanese manufacturers, maybe for others too, but it is uh, Honda or whatever, partshouse.com. So check that out. Um, let's see here. We had... Um, an email. Let me see. Of course. God damn Google. Let's see. Okay. Motorbike Mondays. Um, let me see here. We had a guy, Adrian, that had asked us about, let's see here. He said, um, he's interested in cafe racers. He said, from what I've seen out there, my dream bike is a Moto Guzzi air-cooled V2. From listening to one of the podcasts, I get the idea that it probably isn't the best bike for a first-timer. Am I correct? In that mm-hmm. case, I would like to start with a CB550, 750, or a BMW R90-6. slash What's your opinion on that? What should I look for to start with? Um, he also <laughs> noted that on the Tool episode, he assumed a table vice was essential, but we didn't mention it. Yes. What We're are your thoughts that. on that? Yeah, we talked about the shop before we got here. Um, it's definitely essential. Def- <laughs> I mean, you can get by without it, but you're not going to like life as much with one. A vice makes everything or, a lot Did yeah. I say that backwards? No, I think that was correct. Okay. Um, that's period. Correct. Yeah, we definitely should have mentioned a vice. Those yeah. are very useful. Um, and also, you can get at least two times the use out of one if it is solidly it's solid mounted to yeah. a surface yeah oh, yeah um, i've got a big one on my workbench and i use it all the time so yeah so find the most stable table and just mount the shit out of that thing yeah it um i would look for one that is has two sides to the clamping end like the one i have has a like a big flat section so you can you know clamp like bigger things into it but it also has another side with removable um i don't know what to call them jaws jaws yeah there you go and so it's got like fittings in it so you can clamp tubes or pipe yeah that's really cool and that's that's really useful like pretty expensive yeah that thing it's a a olympic or olympia or something like that Mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure it was probably a harbor freight one or something no it's, it's not. not? I mean, no. My dad gave it to Harbor me. I'm not Freight sure where has he one got that's it. Similar to that. Um, I mean, it's just a style of vice, you know. But, yeah. But it's badass. Yeah, that I looks, love that, that thing. Looks super fancy. It, it rotates. It's got clamps on the bottom, so you can rotate the entire thing around, and then it's got a flat anvil top, mm-hmm. so you can like hammer stuff on yeah. it. Yeah. Most all vices will have a little flat spot where you can just beat shit up on. I would get one with a rotating base like that, though, because That's being able to really spin it fancy. is really helpful. Yeah, I um, I hate our lathe or our freaking vice now. It's got a really long well, like, our vice throw on it. Only too. mounted in one spot. Yeah, it's got one spot where it's <laughs> and it's not even bolted. It just has a bolt going into the table. Yeah, not, <laughs> no, it's, it that's one of those that. those like oh let's just mount it real quick and and see if it works. Yeah, and then it stayed like that. No, it's useful to get. Um, this one has three mounting holes on oh, no. it, well, so what it's really was, solid. The old one was mounted, but then I broke the vise, and we had yeah. to get a new one, so we just threw it in with That's one right. bolt. That's right. Because the mounting holes were different. <laughs> yeah, the, more, the more the better is there. <laughs> the, uh, is the recommended. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned last time a torch in the tool episode, but... I have recently got a map gas torch, and that thing is oh, a lifesaver. Did yeah, we say that? Yeah, yeah okay. we said torch. That thing is awesome. Yeah. I've never had one before, and I'm sold on You heat a lot of shit They're up, great. and metal likes to work a lot easier when yeah. it's hot. Yeah. I also got, I don't think I mentioned this either, I got a little, um, uh, I think it's a butane torch. Yeah, we talked about did it. Did we mention mm-hmm. that? Yeah, that the, thing, with the soldiers. Yeah. It's for soldier, for soldiering. Just, yep. <laughs> that thing is badass. Don't worry, guys. I'm already sick. <laughs> just hit me a little bit more. <laughs> We're just going to send the truth. Yeah, well, you're Kick down. You, you might down. as well take advantage of it. <laughs> um, that thing's awesome. It's got like a soldering iron tip and a and a like a heat gun heat, tip, yeah. and it's it's and it came badass. With, like, it has like four different kinds of tips on it. Yeah, yeah. Use it for cutting and, it comes and with solder. solder. And I love yeah. that solder. It's. Good. It's, it's really good. It was fifteen dollars. I'm I'm sold on it. And yeah. then the cans of gas are only three bucks, so it's it's good. Oh, yeah. Deal. yeah, and then I've gone or at least the I still have like my first 
butane like refiller. Yeah. Or butane yeah. refiller that they seem to last has, a while. Like, four more bikes of, yeah. of wiring done. Well, I well, used you're going to be doing the wiring of my I, bikes now, so <laughs> I'll give you the butane. All right, give me the gas. <laughs> I used that thing. I was working on a – I rewired – from the ground up, a full scratch built dual sport kit last Saturday on a XR 650R, and I used that thing soldering and for heat shrink tubing all day long. Like I worked on that bike for six and a half hours, and so I probably used that torch for close to an hour total, and I got like the entire day on one refill. That's which true. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it lasted that long. Man, but it was. I modified was mine cool. so it burns a lot faster. Well, this one's like adjustable. Yeah, yeah no. he he, okay. he adjusted it like you know how the adjustable I, lighters. Yeah. yeah, you can take it out and yeah, like yeah, just yeah. crank it all the way up. I did that on yeah. on that. I haven't. I mean, the high setting works really well. I haven't seen the need for it, but it might be I'm, helpful. Might oh, be I, I always bit. have it up on the high setting. Yeah. The only thing I don't like about it is how you have to slide it up and then light it and then That's it annoying. burns your finger. Yeah. You, I, like, I hold it with the lighter. Finger. Like I, yeah. I hold it up with my thumb, light it, and then I hold it with the lighter so that until it catches. Yeah. That's, uh, definitely dangerous. And yeah. then if you're not paying attention, like when you're soldering, it's got a little vent hole. Yeah. And you don't pay burns, attention where the thing is pointing. It burns so bad. And it, <laughs> it comes on hot. like, it like happens immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And then all this, your skin's boiling. Yeah. I've got a couple burns from yeah. that already, but. It's a good tool. Um, Anyways, this guy. Okay, so Adrian. So what do you think? A Moto Guzzi. Um, okay, I've had one. Uh, I haven't had any. A, I don't have very have any an, experience with Moto Guzzi. No. I had an Ambassador, a 73 that Ambassador so 750. so awesome. Awesome bike. And it needs a lot I never, yeah, I got rid of it, so I never got it running. But my initial thought on them is like – Difficulty wise, they are no worse than the BMWs. They're yeah. a different engine design, but they're very similar to the BMWs. Um, we're talking about seventies Moto Guzzi's. That's all I have experience with, mm. and I'm no expert on them. But I don't see any reason why not. The downside is parts are more expensive. Everything's more um, expensive. They're hard to find, um, and just support. There's not quite as much info on them. Yeah. They have those hard, chrome plated like, cylinders. That's what yeah, that's what we found out on that. That's one. a downfall. The cylinders, like I don't think that's on all of them. Hey, can we? Shut no, that? they got rid of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll shut it in a minute. Um. So, anyways, I mean, there's no reason not to if you get a killer deal on the bike. I mean, why not? It's an awesome bike. Mm-hmm. Um. Problem is, you know, it sounds like you haven't found one, so finding one for a good price is going to be fairly difficult. Um. And then sourcing parts for it is going to be expensive and difficult. Yeah. So from that. Um, point of view, no, it's not a great bike to start with, but that being said, if you could find one for a good price, then mm, I would certainly jump on it. They're yeah. awesome. Um, but you know, like you said, your other bikes, the CB 550, 750, those are obviously, we've talked about those in detail. Those mm-hmm. are going to be way easier to find, probably cheaper. Parts are easy and cheap, a lot um, more support and information. So you'll probably have an easier time overall with those, but you know. I think it really depends on what you can get. The and bike they're for. solid bikes yeah. too. Well, yeah, I mean, so are, the so are the Guzzi's. Those things yeah. are like tractor engines, mm-hmm. man. Well, if, I'm not saying they're if not. they hadn't like like that one I had, if that thing hadn't gotten water in it, that engine would have ran for another hundred thousand oh, yeah. miles. Like, there's nothing. It's just yeah, but yeah. Know, well, it seems like if, one. <laughs> if you're already kind of flirting with the idea, I would definitely say uh, get kind of. Um, a bike, say like a uh, like you mentioned, the 550 or 750, or even the BMW, um, to kind of get you going, and then you'll more than likely uh, get it on the road and actually use it a lot quicker than say like a Project Guzzi. Um, and then you can always keep your then, eyes open. Yeah, yeah you can always project. keep your eyes open, or even find one, and you're still having fun. You're out on the road. You're still enjoying, um, uh, enjoying your bike, where you can. Uh, I mean, who doesn't like more toys anyways? Yeah. So I love more toys. Yeah, you've been loading <laughs> up on toys. But the um, he mentioned the R90. Like, if you could find a BMW, an Airhead for a good price, that's an awesome bike too. Mm-hmm. So really depends on your starting price and what your plans are. Yeah. You know, all those are fine. Um, let me see. I might have had another email. Let me look. Um, oh, and thanks for uh, mentioning the, the name of uh, – the wrenches that we combination were, uh, wrenches. Yeah. I we oh, that. combination wrenches. Uh, we I don't think we knew the, the name on the name. 
Um, Which I already forgot it, so... Combination to... wrench is it's boxed on one side and open on the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's the quick wrench, which is boxed on one side, but it has a ratchet in it. Yes, yeah, exactly. And then open on the other. And then there's a line wrench that's almost fully boxed, but it has, like, a little section cut out so that you can put it over, like, yeah. a line, you know, to Use those for, like, brake lines and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Those are awesome, yeah. Um, he also mentioned TIG welder. TIG means tungsten inert gas because I think we're we're talking about talking welding. about it. Well, I don't, or were we we're just talking, talking about both, the gas? I don't think we knew what. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that uh, sounded sorry. good. Kermit, Kermit the Frog is here too. So, uh, no, yeah, into tungsten inert much gas. More extreme then, than I thought. I think we were stumbling on <clears throat> what the M standed for in MIG, but. No. Whatever. It doesn't matter. It's MIG and TIG. I wonder what MIG means. Um, quick Google search should answer the question. Mm. Just the metal word. MIG, metal inert gas welding. Oh. I didn't well, that know that either. Sense. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So what we All right, got next? So we in- answered those questions uh, weeks later. Okay. <laughs> we answered Adrian's question. Um, we had David who said... Um, hey guys, want to start off by saying awesome podcast. Thank you. I enjoy listening. Did you just pat yourself on the back. Well, yeah, I'm doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> David said so. I've been interested in building a bike for several years now, but haven't had the knowledge or funds to do so. Um, after listening to you guys, I've been combing Craigslist obsessively to find an affordable fixer upper. I live in Richmond, Virginia and want something small to ride around town, uh, besides a moped. I found this Honda S90 on Craigslist. He sent a link to it, but I waited too long and it's expired. Probably expired. Um, or he bought it. Hopefully he bought it, yeah. He said the clutch is hairy. Um, I remember I actually Shave looked it. at this. He sent me this email five days ago. I did look at the picture before it went down, mm. but I don't remember. The guy described it a little bit. I think he said the clutch was slipping or something. Yeah. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was in his price range. Do we have any experience or opinions? <laughs> Please get back to me so I know if this tu- is if this turd <laughs> is worth polishing. <laughs> um, I don't have any experience with the S ninety. I had what to look is it an S ninety? It's a it's a little um, like it's a, a it's no. a four stroke it's two like valve a, four it's stroke like a baby baby dream. Yeah, it looks similar to a dream. It's oh, got yeah. a steel frame like the press steel frame where mm. the engine's part of the frame hangs underneath it. Um, you know, I don't know anything about them. The engine looks very similar to what was used in like the, the, trails the trail, and, like yeah. the CT90. It's probably more like um, the street little goer. I've worked on plenty of those engines, so I think it's probably very similar. They're super easy to work on. The yeah. valves are accessible. The the um, and there's points two are accessible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's nothing to it. I mean, they're dead simple. So yeah, you know, um, the, a fun little guy. The clutch can't be a big deal. No. I mean, it, Definitely you know, not. Even if you have to do the plates or whatever, you're not looking at much. Yeah, and if they do make – or if they do use the same motor as like the Trail, say the Trail 70 they're, or Trail 90. They're all over the place. I bet they're the same internal parts. Yeah. I mean the clutches on those – I mean they pretty much sell everything brand uh, yeah, that's new. That's the same engine. Yeah. Um, you so, can buy um, like newer engines for those too that – Pulled yeah, right in. Like and we you, have a oh friend, yeah, uh-huh. we have a friend that has a Trail seventy, and he just put a one forty cc. Well, you can get the Chinese Chinese yeah. knockoff engines. Mm-hmm. They're direct copies of the Hondas, like brand new yeah. for three hundred no bucks. Yeah. yeah, so that might I yeah, be go it. for it, man. If that thing's cheap, like there's yeah. no problem you can't solve on one of oh, those. Definitely. So I'd say go for it. Um, that'd be a really cool little bike, especially if the gas tank's in good shape and still mm-hmm. has the chrome inserts and stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's a that that'd be a nice little town bike. So, go for it. All right. Sorry um, if we're too late on that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully, it's down because you picked it up. Yeah. Um, I think that's all our emails. We did get an email from I don't know. How to say this round Rauno Rauno Runo R A U N O. I'm not. I don't know how to pronounce your name, but thank you for the email. Um, <laughs> he. He he gave us some good advice. I dig your show and content. You should, however, invest in better <laughs> microphones. It makes a world of difference to the auto quality. Well, hey, Rauno, this is for you. Yeah, sorry um, we're butchering your name. Yeah, I'm sure that's horrible. But I hope this sounds better. Thanks for the advice. We took it, and we now, stuff. now we sound like professionals. Yeah, so hopefully. Enjoy. <laughs> um, all right, so anyways, that, that's all our emails and stuff. Um, so what's in the shop? Uh, I guess uh, I'll What's go first. What's in the shop? 
Um, <laughs> What's in the shot? All right. This is the voice. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I pretty much have the same stuff I've had in the shop for a while. Um, except the, so those three Thanksgiving slow you down all that turkey. It did actually. I, I pretty much lost a full week cause we had <laughs> Thanksgiving at my house and then, um, uh, well, I guess that was the only one that really took like a day of prep. Yeah. But, um, uh, so I, I pretty much lost a week around Thanksgiving time to finish and then, yeah. uh, and then I got sick and nearly passed out while working. And then, um, but, uh, the CB 550 is in its final stage, which is, um, what is that? Pretty much just, uh, finish up electrical, um, and, uh, all the little detail stuff. Um, like uh, I just finished up wrapping the pipes today, mounting those. Um, so everything's painted, done, just, nice. it's just, uh, the function part or getting everything to work together. Send me some pictures so I can put Alan those up. I will not, um, only because. Was it top secret? Or? No, it's just at this point, I even like to the client, like once there's paint on it, I don't oh. really, I kind of keep it undergo. All right. Um, but if you do, um, keep an eye on seaweed and gravels, like feed. Um, will that release, be, there will be a bunch of pictures. Yeah. And, uh, party. we're, we'll probably be doing a release party for that, um, in a couple weeks. Oh, nice. Um, That'd be awesome. So that's pretty much Free that. Beer. Yeah. Well, Live I'm band. there. Um, I'm yeah. Sold. And we got a couple bikes out of the shop too Thank last week. God. So that was nice. A little bit more room to work in. Oh, and then we got, a, what happened can, with the TX? Is that not, done? Yeah. TX is yeah. good. TX is back. Chris is happy. Came and picked it up. Um, and it's running and everything's, everything's Mike fine, in your face. Everything's fine and there buttoned up. When, nah, never mind. Um, what else are you working on? Are you done with what's in the shop? Yeah, that's what's in the shop. Um, for me, I'm still, I was waiting on parts and stuff and I was buying a lot of tools. Um, but so a couple weeks ago I bought a JD2 bender and, then I was looking around for a die, trying to find somebody I could borrow a die from. Nobody had the one I needed, so the I dies just dies are super expensive. Yeah, right? they're two hundred yeah, bucks. It's pretty cheap Jeez. to get into the bender, and then it's the dies that are. Yeah. Well, the the you. die costs almost as much as the bender does. So um, I don't know. Anyway, so I got I got the bender. Um, I got the die in like two weeks, a week ago maybe. Yeah. And um, so now. Uh, I finally had time this last week to start. Um, I finally made the hoop for the 550 and then for the seat, like the rear of the frame. Yeah. The, the subframe, um, I hooped it and did some, uh, some metal work back there. Mm -hmm. And then today, um, got it all mounted up and welded in and then welded in the inner fender or not the inner fender, but put a fender on it. Got that all up there and going, so it's back in full swing. Um, I should be back on track pretty soon. Um, we that Triumph Bonneville that I had, I oh got, yeah, got rid of that. I I handed that off to a buddy of ours because um, I just kind of felt like it was going to be more Way of a project yeah. than I had time for and yeah. that I yeah. kind of signed up for. Right. Um, so and the the buddy that I gave it to, he's a good dude. He's a big triumph guy and he knows a lot more about him than i do um yeah that's uh john john close fab. fab yeah check him out on yeah. instagram close he, fab he makes some really awesome uh lathe parts like yeah lathe, like <clears throat> tail lights anything he can mm. make anything on the lathe he's insanely Clo good spell it close, close fab, fab c-l-o-s-e-f-a-b um he's, yeah and also he, his like, tail lights is he like local OCC, guy yeah occ huh. choppers is put his tail lights on their yeah on their it's like bikes. the only cool thing on their bikes yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and he does like um wait they build bikes i thought they just fight <laughs> uh he does uh some uh like he can even make you like matching foot uh foot pegs and stuff like that so yeah, he does really handmade. really cool, cool stuff so check, him, check out. him out definitely um, oh wow um, and then uh what else do i have where is he show? at he's out he's of san marcos, san marcos. Oh, okay um, and he ships too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We got yeah. a new compressor. I bought a new compressor. Yeah, uh, nice. Big sixty gallon, six tank. horsepower, 
um, compressor, which is now in the shop, and we got it all wired in, and we got a we is built a housing for it. No, uh. no, that's not it. We built the housing for it, so it's super quiet. Um, and then also, what's in the shop is a 1972 Ford F two fifty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, pick that thing up a couple days ago. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, runs and drives, and it's awesome. I've just been doing a couple little things to it here and there. Um, but I think that's all I got for me in the shop. Yeah. Um. So I've been well, mainly working on other people's projects. Um, I uh, still trying to sell that XS seven hundred and fifty. Um, I have given up on that thing, so it is for sale. Oh yeah. And still trying to get rid of it. Go ahead. Do you have something to add? Yeah. Well, <laughs> also in my shop. Um, the I finally buttoned up my my KZ 750 twin. Um, finished everything, put it all back together, put a brand new anti gravity battery in it. Um, <clears throat> everything's running, it runs great. It starts, you know, uh, it's all up to date and registered, and that is also for sale. Um, so we'll post some pictures of it on the site, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool bike. It's a little bobber. Um, and that's all I had to add to that. That's a good idea. I'm going to put some pictures of the XS on the website. Yeah. Yeah, we'll post pictures. And I got some new pictures of the of the Honda, too, to put up there. Yeah, we need to put more pictures up. Um, so, anyways, I have been working on a lot of customer bikes. I uh, just redid a – hey, can you grab me a beer while you're down there? Yeah. Um, I just did on Saturday a massive uh, dual sport kit wiring job on a XR650R. That was a really fun job. A uh, guy was a friend of a friend and um, brought in an old, well, nice XR with a ancient butchered Baja Designs dual sport kit on it. <laughs> and I know those things like the back of my hand. So I actually stripped it all off and then hand built a harness for it, new switch. It wasn't like handle. a, because you've done some wiring diagrams and stuff for them. Yeah, was well, I did, did. I designed all their new kits that they use. Now, but this guy had like an older. Oh god, it was Generation One, I think. <laughs> it was it was probably from <clears throat> god, I don't even know two thousand maybe late nineties. Yeah. I don't know. It was an old one, um, and it was just so haggard. Um, so, anyways, that was it was fun. I got to do a lot of like custom wiring work on it, and I like doing that. So it was like a marathon, like six and a half hour session on Saturday. So it was some good money, and it was a lot of fun. The guy actually. Cool guy. He rides the bike daily. He lives in TJ. He actually works at Bike Bandit, too. Oh, no he way. He set up at Bike Yeah, Bandit. they're based in San Diego, aren't Yeah, they? they're in, like, Otay, right by the border. Yeah. Or San Ysidro or something. Mm. Um, so I don't know why it still takes me a week he, for me to get my parts. <laughs> I told him that. I said, why? You guys are, like, an hour away, yeah. and it takes two weeks to get stuff here. Why is that? <laughs> he didn't have an answer. But oh, um, uh, cool guy, though. It was a good contact, and it was fun. Um, he rides the bike daily. He lives in TJ. And then rides to work every day, so um, he had to like I he had to like bring the bike up and wait. So he gave me a hand on it, and it was cool. It was a fun, fun job. Um, so I've been doing that. Um, just got all the details worked out on this Airhead, this R ninety that I have here. Uh, Going to get going on that. Um, get the parts ordered this week, and hopefully knock it out next week. And then um, I am in in the middle, deep in the middle of the engine rebuild on uh, that dirt bike that I told you guys all about, the RMZ 250. So I am, uh, motor's all stripped down, everything's apart. I'm on a crash course of learning to rebuild transmissions and almost done with that. So then I will get that thing back together and get that bike out of here and off my hands and never see it again. Um, yeah. So that's, that's about it. I'm working on my KLR. Um, I... I guess I'll mention this. I got a set of SW Motec crash bars for my KLR, which are like two uh, steel crash bars that wrap around the gas tank. They look badass. Oh, that's chill. Um, my partner, like- business partner Scott put them on his bike, and they are badass. Like they, they are perfect. They match mm. the bike. They look really cool, and they fit perfectly on his. So once I saw him, I was like, cool, I want a set of those. I've got those two Baja Design Squadron four LEDs yeah, that I want to mount are on the crash bars. As shit. So I get the crash bars in, I bolt them up, and I was up at the cabin at th- for Thanksgiving, um, 
and I put them on up there. So I took the bike apart, got the crash bars on, and they were built wrong. Something was wrong with them, and hmm. they actually hit the gas tank. So oh, I rode man. the bike. Like, I didn't have any choice. I had to. I wanted to ride while I was up there, so I got put it back together, and I rode it, and actually, like, dinged up my tank because the <laughs> bars, like, hit it. Yeah. So, any, I mean, whatever. Like, that bike's going to get trashed anyway. It's a metal so. tank? Yeah, it's a metal tank. Oh, yeah. I would think it would be plastic. So, that kind of sucked, but... Um, Twisted Throttle, where I bought them. They're great guys, really good customer service. And I called them up and told them what happened, and they sent me a return label, like 80 bucks shipping. They covered it. They said, send them back. We'll get you a new set. No problem. So That's cool. I mean, I was stoked. They handled it. No big deal. Yeah. And um, I've just got the bike in pieces. It's such a nightmare to get those bars on because they hit the like motor mount and the um, – peg mounts and the subframe mount so getting it all lined up you actually have to use like a ratchet strap to pull the frame back in line <laughs> it's a nightmare to do man so the bike is in pieces in my garage and will stay that way until i get the bars back <laughs> um so anyways that's everything i've been working on um so today we are going to talk about uh your charging system yes um this is something that um, I'm going to go into some detail on the different parts and how to test them and all that good stuff. Hopefully, this will help you guys out because, you know, we're not, like, going in any particular order. But mm -hmm. if you got a bike that is new to you and you got the bike up and running, um, you know, your charging system may or may not be working. And this will be a good way to describe to you how to test it, make sure all the components are good, and know that your, your charging system is working because... You can get the bike running and get it on the road, but if your battery doesn't stay charged, you're not going far. Yeah, and this so. this topic is is Evan is probably going to uh, <clears throat> actually he will more or be commanding most of uh, of the knowledge that comes out of it. Brady and I are actually going to go to In and Out right now, so <laughs> just <kidding. laughs> uh, so well, you guys can chip in. You guys, what's good, like. I can go into the details and the theory behind this stuff. You guys also have a lot of practical experience in actually testing and fixing this stuff. So that brings another good good side of knowledge to it. Yeah, we just call Although, yeah, you guys do tend to just call <laughs> me to fix it. Well, because so. it's easier just to say, hey, Evan, come over. So, But there's lots of good info we can go over to help you out with this. Um, so first off, I want to talk about tools for this job. Um, there's not a lot that you need. The main thing you have to have is a multimeter um, to do any sort of in-depth uh, charging system troubleshooting. So for a multimeter, I think we kind of touched base on this when we were talking about tools. Um, you know, you don't need a super expensive multimeter, but that being said, the more expensive, the better. You and get it, what you pay for. Yeah, you totally do. You can get by with the free when you buy other crap or the, the free $5 Harbor, Harbor, Freight Harbor Freight ones. They work, but they are horribly inaccurate. And when you really get down to trying to find a pretty confusing electrical problem, they will be frustrating. So you can get, you know, if you're in the 40 to $60 price range, you can get a nice meter. The best, like, I, I think the Fluke meters are the best. They make really nice auto-ranging multimeters, which means... You don't have to pick a range um, for the measurement you're taking. You just connect the leads, and the meter, you know, takes the measurement and sets the range for you. And that's nice too, because it's really it's like helpful. Sometimes, or most of the time, actually, all of the time, I don't even know what range I'm doing. I right. just know that I'm, right. I'm trying to ohm something out, or I'm looking for voltage on something. That's so. exactly what happens. <clears throat> is if you don't know what a reasonable result for the measurement is, you don't know where to set the range. And then you get the so, wrong reading, or you get a reading, and but that's not the right, right. result that you need. If so. the meter is below, like the range is lower than what you should measure, you won't get anything. And if it's too high, it'll be really inaccurate. So an, uh, if you can afford it, an auto-ranging multimeter is the way to go. If not, you know, no big deal. But spend 40 bucks and get yourself a decent one. Um, lots of good brands, and um, it'll you know it'll pay off when you're trying to figure this stuff out. Um, you you know a lot of people have test lights like that you can you know they light up to show a connection. Those are helpful for for like general electrical troubleshooting, but that's not really going to help you for a charging system because you need numbers. And you can use your multimeter for that same purpose with test lights. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I would stay away from a test light to do charging system stuff because it really won't give you the detail that you need. 
Um, so, anyways, that'll cover multimeters. Um, I've got a like right now. I've just got a. It's a probably a Chinese like not even a name brand one, but it it has a analog uh, like sweeping needle and a digital screen, and you have to set the range and all, but it works well and it's accurate. So, you know, you don't need to spend a ton of money. And uh, you're an electrical genius, so you know what you're setting the range at. That's the main thing, yeah. I'm going <laughs> to tell you guys for the different tests what ranges you're the looking at. The main thing at. is that he's an electrical genius. So you don't need to uh, <laughs> overthink it. Um, so let's start with the parts of the charging system. Um, so in in uh, most bikes, like we'll use a Honda CB as an example because that's like what we've talked about a lot. So – as I go over this, we'll keep in mind like a CB750 from the let's, mid-70s. Mid-70s. let's say mid-70s, sure. 76. There, there you go, mm-hmm. 76. There are different parts for the dual cam bikes, the 79 to 82 or whatever. They're physically different, but they work the same way. So, you know, the troubleshooting steps will be the same. Um, so first off, you have three main components on a CB. You have a stator. And then you have a rotor, and you have a voltage regulator rectifier. So we'll start with the stator. The stator is very simple. It's a metal core with wire wrapped around it, and that wire then runs out into the wiring harness. Um, It is responsible for generating the current that will be used for the charging system. Um, There's different types of stators. Uh, A three-phase stator, which means there's three coils, uh, individual coils that are tied together. And then there is a single-phase stator, which is one big coil where you have either end of that coil, two wires coming out of it. Oh, and is that uh, that what deciphers whether or not there's like three, uh, say, usually white cables that come out? And yeah, you know how some some have like they're yellow. generally white or yellow. Yeah, you know how some bikes, older bikes especially, might have two wires coming out. Mm. That's a single phase. Okay, a three phase will have three wires. Yeah, so three of the same color wires plus correct. like two other wires. The others are on the CB is for the um, for the brushes for the rotor. Okay, so your stator. Um, we're talking about a CB. The CBs use a. I don't know the real term. I call it a ring stator or an outer stator because it looks like it's basically a cylinder. The rotor sits and spins inside of it. So I call it a ring stator. It looks like a like if you took like a wedding ring and made it a lot bigger. It's what it looks like, that shape, I guess. Um, so anyways, a three-phase stator then has three wires coming out of it. Those wires are actually three individual coils, and they are tied together in the middle. There's different configurations, but I'm not going to go into that. It's kind of overkill. So as far as you need to know, the three wires that are the same color, for instance, on a CB, I I know off the top of my head for sure the dual overhead cam models, so I probably won't get the wire colors right for the earlier ones. But for instance, on the the later ones, like there will be three, I think they're whites on white wires on White, that bike. Yeah. That is the stator windings. And then you'll have two other wires in the connector that comes out of the stator housing. And that will be, I think, a red and a black. Does mm-hmm. that make sense for the yeah. earlier bikes? Okay. Or, uh, yeah. Either white or yellow. You know. There's a green in there, too. White, yellow, black, red, and green, and brown. That's on the regulator, though. Oh, okay. So I'm talking about the... Uh, you are On correct. the Hondas, it's usually a six-pin connector, and there's mm. only five wires in that six-pin connector. The well, three that are the same color are the stator connections, and the two that are different colors are connect to the brushes, which then provide power to the rotor. Yeah. yeah. So for the stators, I'm going to go over the testing procedure for the stators. Now, a new stator, like a brand-new, good, out-of-the-box stator, has... Um, The way you test it is to measure the resistance of each coil. So what you're checking is to see that the wire for each coil is intact, that there's no shorts or breaks in the wire. Now, the way you test that is by measuring the resistance between every pair of the three similar colored wires. So on the Honda, you have three white wires. What you want to do is measure the resistance of each coil, which means you'll take three resistance measurements and you'll use the black and red leads of your meter doesn't matter. There's no polarity, so it doesn't matter which goes to which. And you will take three resistance measurements, um, every combination of two out of those three wires. Now, a brand new out-of-the-box stator, most meters, there's error in your meter, and depending on your meter, you could get different numbers. Um, most meters will measure about 0.7 ohms between each pair. 
So what you're really looking for is that the the number is reasonable, which means most meters will read anywhere in the range of maybe 0.5 to maybe even 1.0. So that, that'll tell you where to set your range. For this test, you want to set your range to the lowest range on the meter. Most meters are set like 2, 200, 2,000, like that. So you'd want to set it to the 2 range because you're trying to measure less than an ohm. So you want to set it to the lowest range. Um, what you're looking for is that the, the measurements are the same or very close. Like you would want to get a 0 0.6 from all three of those measurements or a 0 0.7 or within like a tenth of an ohm, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, whatever. You want them to be very close. If you get really like high measurements, like well over an ohm, 5 ohms, 10 ohms, or you get a dead short, even below 0.5, like your meter goes to zero, you know that you actually have a complete short there instead of a full coil. Is that when it reads OL? No, when it reads OL, that would mean a break in the wire. Oh, your okay. meter is saying overload, which means infinite resistance. There's no connection between these two. Mm. So if you get anything other than a reasonable number, which for, for this case we'll say 0 0.5 to 1.0, if you get anything outside of that, you know you got a bad coil. And if your three coils do not show very similar numbers, you also have a problem because they need to be even. So that's how you test those. So the first thing is the resistance measurement between every pair of two out of three of the similar colored wires. The second test you want to do is the resistance between each of those wires and ground or the case of the engine, uh, engine mounting bolt or the negative terminal of the battery. What you're looking for is a short in one of those coils. You want to make sure there should not be a short. Most meters will read OL for overload. So that means that there is no connection at all between each of those wires and ground. So you want to do that test as well. Each wire, measure the resistance between each of the similar colored wires to ground, and they should all be infinite resistance. If all those things check out, then almost for sure your stator is okay. There can still be other problems, but for the most part, that will tell you that the stator is all right. You can do that too by checking for continuity, right, between those wires. So even like if you're not on ohms, you can just um, well, if, if I there's continuity. Then it's not you connected. could check for continuity between um, each wire and ground, right? But you would not want to check continuity between the wires because you're actually looking for a number. Right. Mm -hmm. No, so, that's what I'm saying. Between each wire and ground. Yes, and continuity. If you have sure. Continuity. Then that's you have bad. a short to ground, yeah. which is bad. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the bike will still technically charge, even if, like, say, one or even two out of the three are grounded. But you will lose really more than a third a piece for each one that's bad. Um, but you know, technically, it'll work. You'll get charge. You'll get current flowing out of one of the coils, but it'll be severely limited. So you need all of those things to check out to know that the stator's in good shape. Um, hmm. Other bikes, like for instance, most Japanese street bikes uh, from the like eighties on up, use a different type of stator, um, not the ring stator like we're talking about for the old Hondas. Also, the Yamaha XS six hundred and fifty uses the exact same type of system. But later bikes, like let's pick a um, like a um, uh, a GS, like a Suzuki GS, mm -hmm. late seventies to mid eighties. Any of those uses, um, I don't know the actual name for these, but they're normally what you'd think of when you think of a stator. They are generally like round in shape, but they have poles like arms sticking out all the way around it. Yeah, and the yeah. coils are wrapped around each of those arms. They're technically the same thing. They have three coils that are wrapped around. Each coil is wrapped around every third arm all the way around, and they're staggered. Mm -hmm. And then you have three wires coming out. The testing procedure is the same. It's just a physically different type of stator. Um, so the test procedure I already said applies exact same thing as how you would test one of those. Um, so those are the different types, the different three-phase, single-phase stators. Um, for a single-phase stator, you only have two wires to deal with, so you just take one resistance measurement between the two, and then you measure from each wire to ground. Same numbers apply. So that's that's your stator testing. Um on the so we'll move on to the rotor. So on the CB, also the Yamaha XS, uh, lots of other Hondas and 70s bikes use this system. There's a rotor that sits in the middle. Now, the rotor on some bikes, the CBs for instance, has what's called a field coil inside of the rotor. The field coil is um, really exactly what it sounds like. It's a 
single coil of wire wrapped around all the way around the inside of the rotor, just a big coil, and it is connected to the outside by the brushes. The brushes are little carbon, like, chunks, basically, that ride on what's usually copper rings on top of the rotor, and they supply current to the coil inside. So basically, when that, when those brushes have voltage across them, one will usually be grounded and one will be positive. You have current flowing through the coil, and that basically turns the rotor into an electromagnet. It energizes it and uh, makes it magnetic, which then forces current to flow inside the stator windings. So the rotors are really simple. Like the testing procedure um, to test the rotor itself, really the only thing you're concerned with is that the field coil is in good shape. Um, you can measure at the rotor itself by measuring resistance between the rings. There will be two copper rings on top of the plate, face plate of the, the rotor, and you can just measure the resistance across them. Um, the Hondas, for instance, they measure a new good rotor out of the box, measures 4.4 uh, ohms. The Yamaha, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's about 5 ohms. You can look up the spec online for your exact bike, but that's really the only test. You just want to measure between the two rotors and see that it matches the spec. Um, you also want to measure from each of those slip rings. I think I said rotor before. I meant slip rings. You want to measure between each of the slip rings and ground or the metal core of the rotor, and that also should be OL on your meter or infinite resistance. So you don't want any connection between the um, field coil and ground. So pretty simple test there. Um, you can also measure, like on the Honda, we were talking about a, fi a six-pin connector that had five wires in it. The two wires that are different colors, like on the Honda, I think they're a black and a red. Those wires are the two wires that connect to the brushes that therefore connect to either side of the field coil. So you can also take your resistance measurement at that connector at those two wires. You'll probably measure a little bit higher than what you would measure at the rotor itself. If, for instance, the Honda rotor measured 4.4 at the slip rings, if you measured it out at the end of the connector, you're going to get some increased resistance because you added a bunch of wire to the equation. Um, so it'll be a little higher, like maybe 4.7 or something. Um, so anyways, that also tells you what range to use. If you know you're expecting... 4.4, you want to use whatever range on your meter is slightly above that. So uh, 20 range if your meter had that. If not, you could use the 200 range, uh, which will make it slightly less accurate, but still good enough. So that's testing for your rotor um, and for the stator. Um, the rotors also... You can test them on the bike easily, like I just described. To get them off the bike, you usually have to have a puller tool on the uh, on the Hondas. It's pretty simple. It's just a bolt that you re you remove the mounting bolt and then screw in the longer bolt, and it presses it off the crankshaft. Um, like bikes like the XS 650 actually use a puller that threads around the rotor. So, anyways, you can look up how to do that for your exact bike. For other bikes, like, for instance, the GS we were using as an example for the other type of stator, those bikes don't use a rotor. They have a flywheel that is basically like a cupped wheel that encloses the stator. There's no testing procedure for the flywheel. They have magnets arrayed around the outside of them that cups the stator. Those magnets generally never go bad. I've seen it before, but it's so unlikely that it's not even a common thing to test for. So your really only thing to test on those type of bikes, uh, which is pretty much any bike from the early 80s on up, is uh, just measuring the stator resistance. So then we'll move on. Will you guys have anything to add? Well, I'm kind of like ranting. Is this No, going you're, okay? yeah, I'm going to go back and listen to this because okay. yeah, I'm just trying not to throw up and pass <laughs> out right now. But it's a lot of good shit going on right now. I, am I describing this okay? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's making enough sense. Enough detail, but not mm -hmm. too much? Okay. So then we'll talk about the voltage regulator now. Um, the voltage regulator, also called a rectifier, regulator rectifier, a lot of different names for it. Um, it provides two functions, and on bikes like the CBs that have a, a rotor with a field coil, um, I guess I'll say it, it still provides two functions, but it works differently than other bikes. So, yeah, okay, I'm going to try and... Not get overcomplicated here. So we'll talk about the two different functions it does. There's So we'll call it a regulator rectifier. First thing it does, 
I'm going to start with rectifi- rectification. So what that means is the rectifier converts alternating current, AC current, to DC current. Your battery needs DC current. Batteries are DC. They have a specific voltage, like a 12-volt battery is what most bikes use, and it provides a constant 12 volts. There is positive 12 volts between the negative terminal and the positive terminal on the battery. Now, your stator generates alternating current. What that means is as the rotor is spinning, um, the polarity of the magnet is changing, and it generates a positive polarity current and then a negative polarity current. If you've ever seen a sine wave, looks like an S on its side. You know what I'm talking about? Mm. That's the description of what this does. So the current swings in the positive polarity and then the negative polarity. So I did not know that's what the symbol meant. Yeah, that's what um, that's what. Yeah, this guy is. This mm. is positive. This is negative, and this this is a representation of both the voltage. Like we'll say, this is like Evan's drawing a diagram. I'm drawing for a diagram. Us right now. I'll put a diagram on the website too. So we'll say this is if you're measuring AC voltage, mm-hmm. it would be going like positive and then negative and then positive and then negative. Well, your battery just needs the positive side. Mm-hmm. Your battery needs between zero and the positive peak. That's what your battery needs to charge. So what the rectifier does is chops out. The negative oh, the portion. Negative. Oh, okay. So it does that by uh, with electrical components called diodes. Diodes are basically like one-way gates. Um, they let current flow in the positive direction, and they block current in the negative direction. So I'll put up some stuff. My website at racetechelectric.com, if you go to the tech support section, and then voltage regulators, there's a really good description in detail of how this works. Man. I'll copy those pages and put them up on the website. That's so genius. Those old so guys. So if your that- rectifier goes out, it's the diodes are, are, are done, and they're letting in negative... They fail in different ways. The diodes can burn up, in which case they will generally open up. Uh-huh. And in that case, there's no connection through the rectifier. Um, when that happens, the stator is still generating current, but the current has nowhere to go. Uh-huh. Think of the rectifier like the gatekeeper to pass current onto the battery. You shall not <laughs> pass. It's exactly like that. <laughs> if those diodes burn up, which which happens sometimes, there's no connection to the battery, and that's a quick way to burn up your stator because the stator is still producing current. It doesn't know. It's stupid. It produces current anytime the rotor spinning and there's it's magnetic so yeah. it doesn't know any different if that current's not being consumed the stator will overheat and the windings will melt so your regulator is regulator rectifier unit is important that it's in good shape um so one the the test the only way you can really easily like say you just have a regulator sitting on your bench and you want to test it the only test you can really do on a bench or like externally without running the bike is to test the diodes inside the rectifier it's kind of hard to explain this like in in uh like talking it's much easier to look at a diagram or look at just the steps so i will put all this on the website but basically what you do is your meter needs to have a diode setting the diode symbol looks like a little like a triangle an arrow with a line through it and that indicates current going in one direction and not the other so you, what you're doing is using the diode function on your meter, which basically, when you connect your meter, it pushes current from the battery inside your meter through the diodes. And then it tells you that, okay, current flowed in this direction. Here's the voltage drop I saw across the diode. Once you flip your leads on your meter and you do it backwards, the diode should then block the current and there should be no voltage across it. Oh, so that's what you're testing. I had no idea that's what that's for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it actually like sends current from the battery inside your meter. Yeah. And if, then it, it measures the voltage drop and tells you. Okay. Yeah, because I, <clears throat> if I, if the multimeter is not giving me the numbers I look for, I just switch those and see if that does anything else. <laughs> yeah, and if it does, that meant that you were, it's called it's called forward biasing and reverse biasing a diode. When okay. you forward bias it, you're pushing current through it, forward <clears throat> through it, <throat> and you should, your meter should show you a voltage. Now, generally, this is, most diodes, like a standard diode, this is just like fact. The voltage drop across a diode is usually 0.7 volts. Mm. And 
your meter, however, is not super accurate and there's other error introduced yeah. through the circuit. So a lot of times, depending on your meter, they can measure 0.5 volts. They can measure 1.5 volts. It's not super critical because there's so many different meters and then different ways they actually measure this that it's not – totally critical exactly what that number is but mm. it's more important that when you do it in the forward direction you get a number and when you do all the diodes in turn you get the same number or very similar and then when you do it backwards you should get zero or overload or whatever your meter gotcha. shows so it's important like the outcome not necessarily what the number is so again i will put up all this testing procedure on the website it's it's kind of hard to wrap your head around it without like seeing it written down mm-hmm. um so anyways, you, but you'll use the diode setting on your meter. You will test from the connector on the regulator. Um, you'll be dealing with the connector that has the three wires that go to the stator. There will generally be three wires of the same color, like yellows or whites. And then you will be dealing with the battery connection out of the regulator, which a lot of times is a black and a red. Sometimes it's like a green and a red. Mm-hmm. Depends on the bike. But those are the wires. So you'll be concerned on a three-phase regulator, you'll be concerned with five wires. Three to the stator, two to the battery. Those are the ones you will test the diodes through. And you basically do, there's six diodes in the rectifier for a three-phase rectifier. You will be doing basically um, six, oh, six um, tests. Another thing, too, um, in a lot of bikes that um, where these wires are, um, there are also, like, additional wires that may not have been mentioned. A lot of the times, that's, like, the oil pressure um, sensor or, or neutral sensor, light. Like neutral this is, light. And they all come out of the case. But that's part one, of yeah, the state That's of part sensor. of, like, the, the, the loom. Yeah, um, that, that, that the, comes the out. Pain. Right. Yeah, and those ones are usually like a color, and then have a another a additional stripe. like a blue stripe with a it. red right. stripe, right. and so a green don't, with a red don't stripe. Don't get confused by those, and and thinking like, oh shit, my bike has like so many more wires. Yeah. And now my head is exploded. Well, I'm I'm being really generic about the individual like components, so mm-hmm. you will need to look up what the wire color means for your yeah. particular bike. So I'll describe what to test and what the wire functions are. You'll You'll have to be you'll have to be in charge of figuring out what color wires those yeah, functions definitely. are on your bike. And on a lot of these old like on a lot of the forums that are specific to your make of bike, you can find a chart that shows wire color and then what that wire color did, yeah, which makes correct. it easier because across the whole, well, for the most part, like. Hondas use the same color wires for the same things. Yamahas yeah, correct, use the same yeah. color wires for the same things. Right. Even if you're in like a CB550 and uh, like a Honda Trail kind of thing. Right. You know, it's all – they use similar wires. And then yeah. also another thing um, with with these older bikes that we're talking about, most of them have – until like uh, dual overhead came along – they had a separate regulator and rectifier instead yeah. of a combo unit. Right. So keep yeah. that in mind as well. Well, Yamaha, they, they had them out before um, – it was standard pretty much before like Honda did. Yeah. Um, to do a single unit. Yeah, the combo. Like, yeah. I mean they rectifier. still did earlier earlier in, mm-hmm. in earlier 70s I guess. But I'll, I'm going to discuss that in a minute about the combo units. Sorry for spoiling You're the surprise. You're jumping ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um. So that's how the rectifier works and the generic test procedure. I will put up more details about that. So make sure to look at the website for the details on doing that test. The other half, the other function the unit does is regulation. Now, what that means, so your rectifier is converting AC current to DC current and then basically passing it on to the battery. Now, the problem is your charging system, your stator, generates more current based on RPM. So it can generate more current and a higher peak voltage than the battery can handle. Your battery is a 12-volt battery, and it can handle up to like 14 and a half, 15 tops. You don't want the battery to sit higher than 15 volts for very long because it'll overcharge and damage the battery. So you have what's called the regulator, and that's in charge of keeping the voltage low enough um, or within the range the battery needs. So it, it keeps the voltage. The regulation point on most regulators is about 14.6 volts. That's the point where your battery will be fully charging because it's got a higher voltage and causing more current to flow into it, but it doesn't allow it to go high enough to actually damage the battery. So 
on co- like current, um, well, modern solid state regulators. Um, I'll explain how they work real quick. So your your rectifier. Well, I exp- okay. I'm trying to think how to do this. Well, so your rectifier is doing its job, converting the alternating current from the stator to um, direct current for the battery. Your regulator basically monitors the battery voltage to see how high it gets. Now, when the regulator sees that the battery voltage is at its peak at 14.6 volts, it doesn't want to allow the voltage to climb anymore. It's got to hold it down. So it does that. Most most modern regulators do that. They're called shunt-type regulators. It does that by shunting off excess current or once the battery's fully charged, it shunts off all the current um, to be dissipated as heat. So that's why the regulator housing has little fins oh. on it because it's meant to be air-cooled. So air going past it pulls heat out of the fins and cools down the components inside. I did not – I know those things get hot, but I did not know that's why. Yeah, that's why a lot of times you can mount – like you might have regulators fail a bunch on a bike. Yeah. But if you mount them somewhere that they get a lot of airflow, they'll mm-hmm. last forever. So that's that totally helps to cool so down. So definitely keep that in mind when, say, you're doing a build <laughs> and where you're trying to hide it. Yeah. Don't do a really good job at the hiding The worst that. thing you can do is put them under the seat or under a cowl or yeah. something where they get no airflow. Oh, mm-hmm. that's kind of where I always put them. No, it's horrible. I've, it's horrible. On older I don't bikes know if I want to get this one away. Yeah. Older bikes yeah. that don't <laughs> generate a ton of power, like these old Hondas, they're not. I was vague with they're, it. So. They're crappy charging systems well, to begin with. All we have to do with. is just look at the photo and find it. Well, I usually I usually mount mine. I Well, first off, I usually convert uh, the, which you're probably going to get into, but um, um, I convert to the combo regular rectifier, say on the older bikes, and I mount it uh, in the front of the bike on the frame, like right below the triple tree. Um, and uh, I mean, it's getting hit with like nothing but just air while riding, and yeah, it disappears perfect. as well. Um, and actually, like the new Bonneville, like Triumphs, uh, they put that's where they put them there. The Probably old ones the front used too. to. They put yeah. them on that. They had a little like bullet shaped. Yeah, housing. Those are really cool. Those they made it fun. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Harley does a decent job. They mm-hmm. they mount them down at the down front, the lower, yeah, at yeah. the front bottom of the frame. Yeah, the more airflow, the better. Um, so how they work is so when the it's got a little circuit inside that is really very stupid it's a it's it's just a voltage divider made up of a bunch of resistors and it basically long story short it measures the battery voltage when it sees the battery voltage is is at its peak it's at 14.6 volts and it can't allow it to go any higher the control circuit then there's a little circuit it's called the control circuit it says okay the battery voltage is high we got to blow off all this excess current it does that by then firing little switches um they're called SCRs, silicon controlled rectifiers they're really dumb they're just a little switch that when they get a voltage across them they get a pulse from the control circuit the switch closes and instead of allowing that current to pass on through the rectifier it closes a switch and dumps it to ground so it literally just – it's really stupid. It yeah. just blows it off as heat. It shorts – it clamps each of the stator windings to ground basically and the current from the stator instead of going to the rectifier and the battery gets dumped to ground and then basically turns just, into heat. Yeah. So is that a mechanical <laughs> regulator? No, it's all electrical. Oh. That's, I'm, just, I'm describing that's how they work but it's kind all, of it's all awesome. electrical. Um, there's Japs, newer, man. there's, <laughs> there's newer styles that are called MOSFET regulators mm. and those basically do the same thing, but instead of using the real, the SCR, the silicon controlled rectifiers are very inefficient. Yeah. They're very inefficient. Plus they're, they're big. Mm-hmm. Each component is really large and it has to be mounted on a copper plate, a, basically a heat sink inside the housing. Yeah, yeah. They take up a ton of room and they're horribly inefficient. What I mean by that is their switching time is really slow. Mm-hmm. So when the um, you got all this this current flowing, when the control circuit says, "Okay, we're too high, blow off," you know, get rid of this current, don't send it to the battery. They take time to switch. So it tells it to switch. It clamps to ground, and then it blows off the current. And then there's a time. There's a spec on all these parts, but there's an amount of time, like in milliseconds, yeah. but an amount of time it takes to release and open up again. 
Uh, and those things can fail like clamped clothes, so they're shunning off current yeah. all the time. It'll overheat and then burn up the diodes and all sorts of other crap. Uh-huh. The control circuits can fail, in which case they will stop telling the um, shunt switches to, to fire, fire at all. Yeah, and then they'll just stay open, overcharging. Or close. Yeah, there's all sorts of ways mm-hmm. they can fail. It's a very dumb system. It's actually really simple how it works. Um, the upside is they're cheap to build. The mm-hmm. components are cheap. Um, they're just... Uh, you know, they're not very smart. So the newer MOSFET styles are much more efficient because they're actually transistors that do the switching. Yeah. They switch extremely fast, and they are much more accurately controlled. They're also a lot more expensive to build. Mm-hmm. It just eliminates more of the – it's more of a self-fail or a, a safe fail. Or fail – what the hell am I trying to <laughs> – That's safe. Yeah, it's a safe fail. Yeah. Now I know what you mean. It's not no, – it, no, it's not really a fail-safe design but they're it's, just it's really that it's they're smarter. more they're more efficient yeah they're it's smart it's not what i am right now right it's the opposite <laughs> of sick brady yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so you really can't test the regulation function on the bench the, there's no way to access those components and to bench test them so testing the regulation side of one of these is really based on running the bike and seeing that it regulates um so let me explain like what I've been describing is generally how a bike like the GS would work that has a stator that's powered or that has flywheel magnets that generates the current and the regulator rectifier does its job. Now, a special case is bikes like the Honda, like the CB750, for instance, that uses a field coil. Now, these guys work kind of different. The way the rectifier works the same way. It's got a diode bridge. It converts alternating mm-hmm. current to direct current. However... These regulate by turning the rotor on and off, by turning oh. the field coil on and off. So they, these guys don't regulate by shunting excess current. What they do is monitor the battery voltage. When the battery says, like, okay, I need – the battery voltage is low. It needs more current to charge up again. What it does is applies current to the brushes and therefore – puts a voltage across the field coil and turns the magnet on. Mm-hmm. When it realizes that the battery voltage is high and the battery is charged, it tells the rotor to turn off. So it basically opens up a switch and now no more current flows through the rotor mm-hmm. and therefore there's no magnet and the yeah. stator's not producing. So really they're a more efficient system. They work more like a car alternator yeah. in that they only generate current when it's needed. When it's needed yeah. However, the switching is still fairly slow and in theory it's a more efficient system in in um yeah, what am I thinking of? Like in practice, it's mm-hmm. really not, but it's a better idea. Problem is, you have parts that wear out. You got brushes that are physically riding on the face of the rotor; they wear down. Yeah. So that's why most bikes use the system like I described on the GS, because you have a flywheel, a stator, and a regulator. There's no moving, no like like friction friction parts. Yeah. Exactly. There's no other parts to wear out. And then you get into other bikes, like in the '80s, the GSXRs, for instance. The FJs from the Yamaha used alternators, like actually gear-driven alternators. We were talking about those before, I think. Yeah. Um, So anyways, that covers like the major components. One thing that's important or a good idea we were talking about was the combo units. So what that means is on 70s bikes, like the single-cam CBs, they actually used separate um, regulator and rectifier units. And the regulator was actually mechanical. Mm -hmm. Like it, it actually had moving parts. Yeah, no, I've yeah. seen those things in there. Well, of course, but they're like you can see like the coils wound and like exactly all kinds of scary shit going on. Yeah, they were they actually were mechanical. They had moving parts and they mm-hmm. worked fine for a while, but by now they generally don't work anymore. Yeah. So, and then the rectifier was a separate piece. It really worked the same way as the modern units did. It was mm-hmm. just a diode bridge, but they were usually like in a little case and. They were like little round button diodes that were stacked up on like heat seeking plates and Mm -hmm. um, they were like soldered in place. A lot of time like the solder gets old and brittle and it breaks. The diodes come loose um, just from vibration or the diodes burn up. Lots of things happen. So it's a good idea to replace those two 
uh, the mechanical regulator and the separate rectifier on these old bikes, you replace them with a, a modern solid state unit like we're talking about. Yeah. And that gives you one unit that's easier to mount anywhere you want. Um, it <clears throat> interfaces like plugs in the same way. So there's really no like rocket science behind it. Mm-hmm. And you can get rid of both of those old ancient inefficient units and replace it with one modern style regulator rectifier. Yeah. And also where that another reason where that comes in handy too is say you are doing a build and you need to hide something. It's a lot easier to hide one thing than it is to hide two things. Yeah, for sure. Um and they're uh um the older style can be a little bulky. Yeah, too, definitely. So. And they're just by this time they're just awkward. They're just they're not reliable anymore. Yeah. Even if they are working, there's mm-hmm. a good chance if you're putting a lot of miles on the bike, they're gonna fail. Yeah. So definitely. this is a very smart upgrade to do. And yeah, it's and like forty years old. So yeah, it's exactly. Like, mm-hmm. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, even if it is work working, there's a good chance it's not. It's gonna, gonna fail soon. Yeah. So and even if it doesn't fail soon, it's just better to replace it so you have a good like you know it's good and you know it's yeah. working mm-hmm. properly. So you can always email us at Motorbike Mondays, contact MotorbikeMondays.com with questions. Um, go check out RacetechElectric.com. The tech support section has tons of detailed info. I spent, I can't even count how much time writing up. I like got everything out of my head and put it on the website, and I feel like nobody uses it. So go <laughs> use <laughs> Well, I that's why we just e- call you. Because I try and send <laughs> everybody to the tech support page. All the testing procedures are there. Do you know, I um, didn't I didn't everything. know that, that that's up there. Um, yeah, I, it's I, a I, good that's, that's kind of stuff that I, when I'm at home in bed, when I can't sleep, um, I'll usually just kind yeah, of, that's my time where I out. like research and just kind of, because there's always something new you can learn about right. or look up on. And uh, I think I'm going to check that out, put that on the list. To, It'd be to good go to through. see. Because if anything, I know my electrical – I can I know how to wire a bike, no problem. But uh, like anything, if you know how it works and why it works, it's – there's no it, – it, it just speeds up the learning curve and – Yeah. Um, well, you can learn – this stuff efficient. is not very complicated. Mm-hmm. So you can very quickly – understand how the individual components work and how to test them easily yeah. and once you learn the general systems they're pretty much the same on all these bikes so mm-hmm. once you know what the components do it's not too difficult i also have a flow chart i'll post this on the website too i've got a pdf file you can download that steps you through fully testing the charging system yeah, on any I think, bike i think i have yeah have that's totally like worth that checking out it's like four pages and it starts from the start and steps you through every single test procedure yeah. we talked about so, and it does, and it gives you readings too. Yeah, like it tells you what the numbers to, should be and, yeah. and what range for your meter and everything. So, did I'll, you talk I'll about that, that one test that you showed me the other day when we were working on the TX about how if you connect like the positive from the rotor to something? Oh else, yeah, it makes it one mental. thing. Oh, that so was, was cool. Chill. This is a quick. <laughs> it's on bikes that use a field coil and a rotor. A quick test you can do if you're trying to decide if the rotor is working or not, basically if the fuel coil is intact or not. Without having to pull it all yeah, out. Yeah, without tearing it. anything apart, if you energize, think of it this way, if you put 12 volts across the two wires for the field coil and basically energize the rotor, it turns into an electromagnet. Mm-hmm. So if you energize that and you hang, what I do is I take like a box wrench or whatever and hang it right next to the, so like vertically right next to the stator cover, basically next to the rotor outside but, the side case. But not touching. like Not touching. Like an eighth like, of an inch away. Exactly. Just barely away from it, but that you can obviously tell it's not touching the side case. Then just use some jumper cables or whatever you got, some some spare wire. Some gator run clips, Run or... voltage directly from your battery to the two wires for the brushes that then go to the rotor. And if you, it doesn't matter the polarity, you just need to apply 12 volts across it. If you do that, the rotor will energize. And if the rotor's intact and it magnetizes, it will suck the wrench against the case. Yeah, it is It such, was really cool when it shows. It, it honestly, it felt like magic. Yeah, so if it you, was magic. If you it did, was magic. He was a magician just doing <laughs> If you do that and you see the And then he pulled the a rabbit wrench, out of his hat. Too. Yeah. Pull, <laughs> if you see that happen, that it's a very quick test, and it tells you that the rotor is good. Because there might be all sorts of other problems, but if you jump... Basically, you're jumping it, basically. If you jump the rotor and it energizes, then the rotor's good and you can look elsewhere for mm-hmm. your charging problems. So, yeah, that's a cool tip. It works 
well. Somebody taught me that or something. I don't even remember where I found that, but it's pretty helpful. So, anyways, I think awesome. that covers it. That's a lot of detail. Good info. I'll put a bunch of resources up on the website to check out. And as always, if you have any questions, email us at contact contact at motorbikemondays.com. Check out the website at motorbikemondays.com. Um, check out racetechelectric.com. Tech support section's got tons of stuff. We also make stators, regulators, rotors for the CBs, XS650, lots of other bikes. So if you're looking for charging system parts, give us a call or an email or check out our website. And check out Seaweed and Gravel, see what these guys are up to. Yeah, definitely. And Follow uh, us on Instagram. Yeah. Um, Did we set up an Instagram yet? Not yet. Need to do that. Yeah, yeah, we're going to we'll set up soon. a Motorbike Monday's Instagram so then we can just post pictures of what we're working on and what we look like when we're sitting here drinking beer, talking to you guys. And, I don't you know. care. Yeah, I don't think they care what we look like drinking beer. Hey, somebody you know, somebody does. It we could gotta, be cool. Some of our fans got to care. Yeah. Well, and also <laughs> uh, look out for um, the uh, bike release. Um, the, we'll have a couple the coming up here. Yeah. Um, at least my bike I've been working on that I've been talking about this whole time uh there will be a bike release soon for that and uh, if you're in the san diego area come uh on come on down and we will feed you and get you buzzed yeah we'll definitely post detail on that so thanks for listening and uh we will be back next week yeah all right see you guys bye